Hey everybody, we're not sure if we're if you can hear us just quite yet, or we have to wait till one o'clock. But if you are listening to us, we're waiting for John to finish up the other session, and then we'll uh, jump on here and begin our uh, secret sites of the Space Coast tour for you. So just stand by. Yes, sir. Hey everybody, welcome to the secret sites on the Space Coast. Uh, John just finished his other session. We see a great number of you are already in this room. Uh, we're gonna wait 60 more seconds and then we'll bring up our camera and, uh, and start our session. So hang on just for another minute, please. Um, afternoon, everybody. Hey, welcome to the secret sites on the Space Coast. And we're coming to you live from the secret site of my office area, which is the family room of our house uh, in Melbourne, Florida. We're about uh, 20 miles or so as the crow flies from the Cape and the rockets, and in an hour, maybe a static test fire of a Falcon 9 rocket. That's Jim Banke. I'm Pat McCarthy. You may remember us from 2019. We were the co-chairs of NARCON 2019 when it was last here in the Cape area. So uh, we've got a few updates for you on what's been happening since then. Uh, if you took the bus tour then, and we had three bus loads of people that took the tour back in 2019, there was a lot to see but you'll be surprised at the development since then. There's quite a bit of activity going on here at the Cape Canaveral Spaceport. So we're gonna to touch on that. And me as an employee of Space Farda, I have to put in the official disclaimer that any uh, opinions or snarky comments that I throw in do not represent those of my employer or the governor of the state of Florida. <laughs> and as a NASA contractor who works for aeronautics, none of this has anything to do with aeronautics. So I have no 
fear whatsoever of saying the wrong thing when we start getting snarky about some topics. Uh, some of the housekeeping, reminding you and repeating probably what you've heard many times already this weekend. Uh, we will take questions in the Q&A section. Um, we're going to keep an eye on those questions as we're showing you our videos. Uh, so we may answer them then or we'll wait till after we're done with our formal presentation to, uh, to answer questions. We're also keeping an eye on the chat, um, but not closely. So if you do have a question or comment uh, in the chat, we, we may or may not see it. Um, as we get into the video, uh, we do have the capability to, to stop and rewind and, and do that kind of thing. In case you miss something, we can come back to something later. Um, it's a, we have about 40 minutes of video to show you and, and about an 80 minute program. Uh, so there's lots of time to get everything done and uh, see what we want to see. And chances are we'll pause the video occasionally if we get to be long winded in our explanations anyway. So feel free to ask those questions and we'll try and uh, hit them up. And I already see on the chat somebody's noticed Cosmic Vest. No, you got to get one. Cosmicvest.com, my official sponsor. <laughs> In fact, I sleep with the boss. <laughs> ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> ooh, risque. I didn't know this was a PG-13 presentation. <laughs> That's right. So we're going to start by uh, sharing with you a welcome from a good friend of Narcon here at the Cape. Uh, each time we've had one, we've been very fortunate uh, uh, to have Bob Cabana, the Kennedy Space Center director, uh, speak before us and talk to us. And uh, he graciously uh, recorded a welcome video for us. And we're going to play that for you now. Hi, KSC Center Director Bob Cavana here. And I want to welcome you all to the National Association of Rocketry Convention here at the Cape. A little bit different this year with COVID. Uh, I hope that some of these little videos that you get uh, make it a little interesting for you. And I, I got something for you after I talk, give you a view of the KSC from my office. This is an exciting time for uh, our space program. You know, this multi-user spaceport here at KSC, where we have government and commercial launches, we're looking at 50 launches over the next uh, five years, 10, 10 flights a year, and just NASA launches. And then you throw in the, the commercial and the government launches on top of that uh, across the Cape. A very amazing time, absolutely outstanding. You know, when I look at what's going on yes, just for KSC, uh, we have commercial crew flying again. Last year, for the first time in nine years, we launched crews to the International Space Station on a U.S. rocket. Bob and Doug Hurley flew that test flight on the uh, Falcon 9 Crew Dragon in uh, May. And then in November, we launched a crew of four on the first uh, actual contract mission with the uh, Crew Dragon to the International Space Station. Boeing's not far behind. We hope to get off a uh, uncrewed test flight on their Atlas V on the uh, CST-100 Starliner that uh, had an incomplete orbital test flight a year ago that corrected their issues and they'll be flying again on an uncrewed test flight soon to fly with crew on their vehicle also. So we had a dissimilar redundancy. But we're really looking forward to the launch of SLS and Orion for the Artemis program. Artemis, of course, the twin sister of Apollo. We're going back to the moon and uh, we're going to put that next man and first woman on the moon in 2024. But this year, we're going to find an uncrewed test flight uh, to the moon with the SLS and Orion. All the hardware is here at KSC except for the core stage. We are ready to process and launch that vehicle. The core stage is over at the Stennis Space Center in Mississippi for a green run test. Uh, they're going to hopefully fly that, uh, do that test here in the next uh, couple weeks. Uh, then we'll come here to KSC for processing and launch and we are ready. The Orion spacecraft is made to the service module. It's ready to go over here in the ONC uh, high bay and uh, we'll soon be going over to the MPPF for uh, fueling. We're already stacking solid rocket segments on the mobile launcher over in the BAB. We've got the aft segments stacked and pretty soon we're going to start, start stacking the center segments. So we're ready. Get that rocket here and uh, we'll get it launched. And you know the launch services program, they've got a huge year in front of them with five missions coming up later in the year. Uh, one that I'm really looking forward to that they're just an advisor on is the uh, James Webb Space Telescope nice uh, launching later this year. Her. You know, as great as Hubble was, James Webb's going to allow us to look back even further in time. So an exciting time for our nation's space program. This is a great place to be at the nation's premier multi-user space program. 
I want to welcome you all. I hope you have a great uh, conference and uh, enjoy this little view of KSC from my office. All right, KSC Center Director Bob Cavani. Okay, we're going to run his uh, the view from his office after we get through the rest of our video because it's really cool. Uh, Bob Cavani is such a, a fun guy and he's so supportive of us and what we've done here both in 2014 and 2019. And again, this year, take time out of his busy schedule to, uh, to send a greeting to us. Yeah, we asked, uh, we asked formal pre permission from the Kennedy Space Center to uh, videotape some restricted areas. And uh, one of the ideas we had was to show you the view out of his window, out of his office window. There's a brand new headquarters building. And um, they said no because of COVID, because the, the Kennedy Space Center is locked down in terms of essential personnel only. Um, but Bob was in on that email train. And so out of the blue, I get this email from him and he's recorded. He had his intern record him uh, at his desk and then he grabbed his own phone and did the view out the window. We'll show that to you at the very end. So it was a, it's a great little story and, and, you know, we love him, love him to death. So, okay, so we're going to tee up now the, uh, the highlight, I guess, of what you've come for. So we're just going to talk through this as a home movie, um, play it for you and uh, take you around the Cape. And again, if you have any questions or comments along the way, uh, you know, pipe in and we'll see what we can do. So let me get it set up. Finally learning how to do all this. And away we go. So we're going to start you off with uh, uh, a welcome screen. Famous Wolfie's Restaurant Sandwich Shop. Uh, so, okay, as you're going along on the Space Coast, we warn you that at any time in a body of water, there may be alligators. So uh, please stay safe. Do not feed them. Welcome to Cape Canaveral. And here's Cape Canaveral Beach. And as you pan from Cocoa Beach, you see all the idled cruise ships, which are anchored a few miles offshore with no customers. Then as we pan towards the north, you can see the brand new Blue Origin launch pad at Complex 36, the smaller Complex 46 run by Space Florida, one of my uh, main foci of uh, effort. And there's Jetty Park, the uh, jetty that sticks out, which is always a great launch viewing location. So here is uh, here is a big highlight of the Cape, um, and, and that is uh, the swimming pool where I learned to swim back in 1972. Our family had come down here from, um, from uh, Minnesota, and we were on vacation, and I'd just spent $82 at the Kennedy Space Center Visitor Center in the gift shop, $82 in 1972 dollars, one of everything, and I learned to swim there. And I think there's a plaque there now, too. So we're going to take you around. So, of course, it's the Space Coast, so we have street signs. We've got John Glenn and Grissom Parkway, Draw Court. Uh, of course, it's nice to see Armstrong and Shepard getting along here at the intersection. So there's all sorts of Apollo and NASA. So, you know, it's Space Coast everywhere. And you may not know, so we even have an I Dream of Genie. Uh, and you'll notice that's put up on a very high post because people keep coming to steal it. <laughs> Unlike regular road signs. That's right. And Barbara's been here a couple of times. And then uh, even though none of it, even though none of it was filmed here. And, and if you watch I Dream of Genie, you can see the mountains in the background when they go downtown. So uh, the Cocoa Beach adopted them. Uh, Apollo Realty, again, they, everybody takes the names of, of the space stuff. And, you know, when you're in the industry town, that's, uh, that's what you see. Instead of Kennedy Space Center Federal Credit Union, which it used to be, they now call it Launch. Federal Credit Union. This was after the shuttle retired and they wanted to be more generic. Here's the uh, racquetball court in Cape Canaveral, which has got this great mural painted on the side of it. So uh, obviously Cape Canaveral loves its uh, space history and space connection. So that's really interesting. We think it's a Gemini guy. The capsule is a little bit artist's uh, misconception, but that's fine. And everybody gets into the act. There's Brevard County traffic operations. So these traffic control boxes at major intersections have been painted up in uh, uh, whimsical space history scenes, which I think is really cool. Uh, you know, here's the uh, STEM initiative with the teacher helping out the student. Uh, not sure which astronaut this is on the side. And then this one, I think, taken from uh, Lady Bird Johnson and LBJ, that uh, photo of them watching one of the Apollo launches. So 
pretty neat stuff to see around town. I did not capture the one that has uh, the Starship, I mean, the uh, Elon Musk uh, Roadster taken off because mm -hmm. it had a cow inside instead of the Starman. So up north in Titusville, there's Astronaut High School. And you think, well, man, going to Astronaut High School must be the coolest thing on the Space Coast as a kid growing up. But you get up there, and it's just this plain, boring building that looks like a prison like you ever – and, and they don't even have a space mascot. They're the they're the home of the war eagles. And it looks more like the Anheuser Busch eagle logo, anyway. Nothing to do with space. So uh, a missed opportunity for a space themed mascot. That's right. Anheuser Busch probably actually better, more symbolic of, of the kids that are up there. They're quite the party group. <laughs> space Space Walk of Fame in Merc or in um, Titusville is a great highlight. And if you ever get a chance to see it, you ought to. The highlight, the centerpiece is the Mercury 7 monument. This is an exact uh, replica, well, not even a replica, it is the exact same. I'm going to pause it here um, of the Mercury 7 monument that's out of Launch Complex 14. When, uh, when the Mercury 7 Foundation first came together as a scholarship organization, the six surviving Mercury astronauts, this is way back in the uh, late 80s, early 90s. Um, and came together. They worked with the city of Titusville, and they wanted to do some kind of big event and fundraiser and and uh, and focus. And so this whole idea of a space walk of fame came together, and they wanted to do the monument. So they went to the company in Ohio that did the original monument. They were the company that provided the aluminum metal for the Atlas rocket, and said, "Can you can you help us do this?" And the guy that ran the company then, it was his father that had done the original Mercury Monument. And they literally went into the attic of the office building and found the blueprints for the Mercury 7 um, Monument and were able to recreate it. So this is an exact duplicate of the monument uh, that's out at 14. And it's just a beautiful area, beautiful site, you know, along, along the river that people can go out there and, and take a look. Of course, this one has a little bit more added to it. Over the years, we were able to uh, do the Grumman's Chinese Theater thing, where we have astronauts put their hands in cement and uh, forever uh, uh, remember it. I think this is actually bronze in this case. I'm not sure. And of course, you, you go, you got to put your hand there. So there's my wife putting her hand in John Glenn's hand. Uh, and here's the famous thing you've probably never seen a secret site the backside of the Mercury 7 monument, a definite highlight. Um, as, as they went along, then the next step was to do Gemini, and so the Project Gemini uh, monument was put up. Same exact idea of taking the, the program logo and uh, uh, putting it to steel and, and putting it up. Um, at the Space View Walk, uh, the, what you're facing toward the river and the Kennedy Space Center across the river is where the Mercury and Gemini monuments are in these trees. And then behind us, as you turn around, then they do Apollo and shuttle. So here's the Apollo monument. Um, the space, uh, the Earth and the moon balls were, uh, let's just say, quite the, uh, quite the topic as, uh, as they were uh, uh, solicited and procured and put up. Uh, yeah, I think the, the RFP called for Apollo balls, and people didn't really know what that was exactly for. Exactly, sure. Uh, you'll see these little obelisks all around. And what this is is an opportunity for people who worked on these various programs to uh, have their name. Uh-oh, uh, be careful. Alligators in every body, or body of water in Florida. So uh, don't go swimming uh, in just, you know, retention ponds. Not smart. Not smart at all. So you can uh, you can actually put your name up there, uh, you know, as a fundraiser, like a brick program. Um, this is the shuttle area. The, the patch of the original space transportation system was the symbol. Uh, this was meant to be the only patch for the shuttle. And then Young and Crippen wanted their own patch, and then Engel and Truly wanted their own patch, and then 135 missions later, everyone has their own patch. But uh, that's the shuttle symbol. You never know what names you'll see hey, up Mr. there. Mr. Banky, is that your name up there? Is the 2011 award winner of the Harry Culkin Memorial News and Communications Award? Why, there award. it is. That's forever and grand. Oh, hey, and look at that. A space honoree, space worker honoree in 2016, Patrick McCarthy. So. You can go up to the Walk of Fame and see our names up there. You take your paper and your pencil and scribble it in. Now you get to downtown Titusville. You're driving south on US-1 in Titusville. And what do you see on the side of the road? But you no know, rocket engines, real rocket engines, and a couple of models. 
Well, this is the American Space Museum, which is a really fabulous and little known uh, museum in Titusville. Only $10 to get in. So beat that, any of you uh, giant uh, museum, uh, museum guys. guys right? <laughs> it's a quaint little museum. It's charming. It's basically guys that have retired, cleaned out their attics, and uh, and um, have connections to to various people. And it's it's just a great museum. We couldn't get in there because it was it was closed the day we were filming. But um, but you can see some of the the relics that the shuttle outside here. This was actually a shuttle that was part of a art program that there was like a dozen of these made and different businesses painted them in different ways. Of course, these guys painted it to scale. Um, and you can see so the rocket engine. So in the background, you can see an Atlas Centaur uh, sign. We're going to show you a closer uh, look at that here in just a second. That is off Launch Complex uh, 36. And here is that actual sign. Um, this was uh, the first Atlas III launch back in 2000. And uh, there's the actual sign. Uh, and now there it is back in Titusville. So it's, it's just, it's that kind of unique, fun space history that you uh, you don't normally get to see. And here we are at uh, the newly renamed uh, Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. So when the Vice President Pence was here a month and a half or so ago, and the day before he showed up, they said, hey, we're going to make an announcement to rename Cape Canaveral Air Force Station to Space Force Station and Patrick Air Force Base to Patrick Space Force Base. So the poor 45th Space Wing guys had to run down to the sign shop, work like crazy overnight to get this sign put up in time for the vice president's visit when he was here for the National Space Council meeting. But now it's there. And when you uh, you drive on base, you see the new Space Force Station sign. And and you can and you can put your politics aside. Uh, I think it's a it, it's kind of a fun idea. It's kind of it's, but we got to get used to the new name. That's that's the hardest part. When you're out at the Space Force Station, you never know what sites you see. Here's a C5 coming in for landing at the 10,000 foot skid strip. If we had audio, you'd be really impressed with the noise right now. It's just yeah. Uh, and so this is how a lot of parts show up. Satellites mostly come in this way. Some rocket parts, other rocket parts show up in a different manner. So here's a Falcon 9 first stage which has been trucked all the way from California at the factory with a stop in Texas at McGregor, Texas for a static engine testing. And then it comes driving into the Cape. So Falcon 9's everywhere. So uh, you can't swing a dead cap without hitting the Falcon <laughs> I thought 9. that was my That's line. Your line. And now they're, they're used Falcon, oh sorry, they're flight proven Falcon 9. Flight proven. This is the one from the December flight that launched the NROL 108 mission landed back at the Cape at uh, LZ-1, landing zone one. And there it is rolling up uh, ICBM road on its way back to and the, the and hangar. And if you thought that was really cool and really cool looking in terms of uh, a Falcon 9 rolling by, here comes another one. Okay. Get off the road. I mean, they're constantly moving these piece parts around. There's you know all these flight proven Falcons rolling back and forth on the Cape between one launch pad and a hangar and another because a lot of times they'll say oh we're going to launch from 39a no they're going to launch it from 40 so they got to pick it up and roll it from one pad to the other and vice versa happens all the time yeah and I a couple of things that are neat about that you saw the the, the, the vehicle well here i guess i can go back 10 seconds um and and the multi-wheeled vehicle that this thing is on that is left over from the space shuttle program that was used to move the orbiters around and payloads around ksc and space sets found another uh use for it the other thing I want to mention, and this is true in terms of living on the Space Coast as part of your everyday job, we're, we're teasing that these rockets are there, but but that you can literally be just going for lunch or between meetings and you have to pull off the road. Everybody, there's a very set rule. You pull off the road a certain way and then the rocket comes by and then you get back on again. Yeah, most of these things travel in the opposite direction of the traffic because that's a little bit less uh, traffic jam that way. But yeah, pull off the road and let them pass. So we're going to take you through some of the favorite pads now. So we're at um, Complex 9, the Navajo pad. And we pan over to Complex 31 and 32, the Minuteman pet test pads with their great beehive block houses. And of course, that's the area where Challenger is buried. Now we're going to take you to Hangar C. And a lot of you have been inside Hangar C. But since we had the last Narcon, or maybe you were here uh uh, well, seven years ago now, to Hangar C, so much has changed. 
in terms of what's in there and the layout and it's just absolutely beautiful we're going to spend some time now um looking through hangar c and letting you uh gawk at some of these uh re refurbished missiles this is the uh pat cam view this is the pat cam i took my uh, rocket cam stuck it on the end of my thermal detector pole and raised it up in the air this is not a drone view i, I scoff at drones this is a uh, real handheld video and that's why it looks so shaky your thermal I thought thermal, it was your fishing pole. Not a fishing pole. I've never fished with it, but I have uh, tried to detect thermals with it. <laughs> so here's the ball mark, and uh, this this is the same missile that for years sat out on on George Phillips uh, Parkway uh, um, as as sort of the the indicator of where you should turn to go down the Air Force Base and Missile Center uh, Museum. Paint a little bit differently. I loved this missile as a kid, if only because it reminded me of the Enterprise Starship Enterprise upside down it was always my favorite uh little missile to put together on that uh on that model kit that had all the missiles on them um really neat stuff you can see some intricate detail that we've uh you know it just the workmanship in all of these missiles is incredible and yeah they've and, all been refurbished by there's two or three different companies that do it and they just do an incredible job take the initial the original blueprints go out and find a lot of original materials or you know, scrape and paint and refurbish the existing materials that were on these missiles. And uh, they just do a fantastic job. And now most of these are going to reside in the hangar because Air Force Museum rules say that if you spent money refurbishing one of these things, you can't put it outside. So the old rocket garden that used to be at uh, Complex 5626 is going to uh, lose most of its outdoor exhibits and they're going to be put here in Hangar C. But they're a lot better and a lot easier to look at, and you can get a lot closer to them, obviously. So, Steve Crystal, these are the kinds of things you can put your hands on, and nobody will holler at you either. <laughs> That's right. And um, here, here's the mace. And, and I also want to just point out, too, that as you're looking at these missiles, you know, look behind the scenes and see the clean floor, the white walls. The LED lights that they have from the ceiling are just, they light up this hangar, and, and the color here is a little misleading it's very bright white in there and um the colors are saturated and rich and 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 really show off this hardware neat uh it is at hangar c uh you have to take a tour there are tours available uh, right now through the uh the uh, lighthouse foundation as a local cocoa beach tour uh, we continue to work on the air force side and the space and missile museum foundation side to uh, to get tours that get people in here when things get back to normal at the visitor complex uh, the then and now type tours, the old timer tours will take you in here as well. Do you have a chance to, to look at these in person? So this is a fun missile too, a little bit of a rocket tree and a little bit of cruise missiles all in one. Yep, and those great Terra Cruiser wheels that they had to tote the thing over soggy fields. Oh, well, we flushed the quail while we were in there. There's a sad dad joke if I ever heard one. <laughs> this, this always reminds me of the Pinewood Derby uh, this is like my Pinewood Derby missile, you know, just the way it's kind of square like that. And and all these missiles were tested at the Cape. Um, that wasn't always true with everything that was out at the Missile Museum. Um, there were some some missiles out there that uh, weren't, but uh, pretty much everything here, including this, I think the the queen or king of them all was the Snark. Uh, uh, just probably the biggest, the funnest, the the color most colorful. I think everybody has a model of this sitting, either they put together or sitting on their shelf. Um, just, just love this bird. Oh, and a question from James Duffy about what became of the Navajo wreckage that used to be back there. Yeah, it was Navajo was knocked off its outdoor pedestal by a hurricane a few years ago. It is off being refurbished now. Pretty much rebuilt. Uh, unfortunately, the booster was almost destroyed, so it's being rebuilt from scratch. Uh, and eventually it'll be back outside the gate at the uh, Space Force Station. And that is coming along. We will see it return in, in the not too distant future. Here with the Pat's thermal cam, you can see the top of the snark, which of course you very rarely get to see because you're walking underneath the thing and it's very hard to see on top. But I love this detail of um, of the striping and, and the, of the livery. Take note of that the next time you put together a model or 
There hasn't been a model rocket of this, has there? No, uh, somebody will try it though, even though it's inherently unstable and scary. Never let that get in the way of a good launch. It hasn't right? stopped a few folks from building models. So here's, here's the classic Atlas uh, missile. Um, this is not, according to what we've heard, the same missile that was sitting out of the Missile Museum for so many years. That one collapsed and was unrecoverable. They were able to get their hands on another missile. Of course, the Atlas uh, first stage is, is a balloon-shaped, balloon-filled, uh, balloon, what am I trying to say, structural uh, integrity. It has to be pressurized air inside. Um, this, this is the same yellow trailer, though, that's been out here for years. And um, the real workhorse of our early space program, um, and no less impressive. Here's a, uh, a Thor Abel, like one of the first lunar vehicle capable boosters that we developed in the US. Love the nose cone. And then again, you can see the white floor and, and everything painted nice, the ceiling fan at the top. I mean, it's just, it's just become, I mean, I'm hard, I keep repeating myself, but it's just, it's so beautiful in there and it's so user friendly, tourist friendly. Uh, and it's taken a lot of work by a lot of people to get it to this point. And um, we really encourage you to, you know, get down here when, when things are back to normal and, and get inside this hangar and take pictures and enjoy it. Yeah, and then here's the uh, thermal pole camera view again of uh, interesting things on the Atlas. Like I had never noticed all these little holes before on there. I presume they're for venting some uh, part of the interstage or something, but uh, very interesting. And you can get these kinds of up close details because you can get right up next to the, to the missile. So scale modelers delight, that's for sure. And then over to the, uh, back to the Thor Abel. Inside the plumber's nightmare inside. Great force. Wonderful, wonderful design back then. You have a tank and you have an engine, so you make a pipe and you connect them. And None of this fancy 3D AutoCAD, you know, printing nonsense, right? <laughs> That's right. Now, this stuff was pounded out with, uh, you know, stretched over molds and, and uh, pounded with hammers and pressed with hydraulic presses and, and everything back in the good old days. Especially the engines, you know, machine shops that were turning out rocket engine parts were uh, where the experts worked. I love the Fire Bee. This is, this is just a fun little little missile, this is like the baby missile, little kids. This always reminds me of a ride, you know, out of the playground with the spring on it, go back and forth. Um, th this camera angle that you're seeing now is, is, is to talk about the offices in Hangar C, and we'll talk a little bit about Bernard von Braun. It, it, is, it, is accepted, it is accepted as fact, it's talked about as a myth um, that he had an office here in Hangar C. The bumper pads, the original rocket launch from Cape uh, in 1950 is is on this end, uh, actually facing the opposite side of this wall. Um, or no, it is facing out because yeah, that's, that's the, the north course, side. The yeah. north side. And so these smaller offices or the larger ones on this side may have been his office. It, it's believed, it's generally accepted by the old timers that he worked up there, uh, but there's no proof. And um, the uh, the current uh, curator and historian. Uh, the Missing Museum has standing orders that if anybody's working in those offices, uh, refurbishing, repainting, which is that kind of work is going on, and they come across anything that even remotely looks like it might have been Von Braun, all work is supposed to stop instantly. And, um, oh, let me pause. Okay, hang on. There you go. Right. So, yeah, they're looking. If anybody finds anything, you know, if they peel off wallboard or drywall or something and find some scribbles on the wall that might be somebody's, then they're going to have um, archaeologists and, and experts come in and take a look at it to see if indeed it was uh, that of Von Braun. Then we get to the wall here where we have the heraldry of the, uh, here at the Cape. Starts off with the Long Range Proving Ground Division. And uh, that's in black and white. And the historian told us that they searched high and low, but as far as they know, there was never a color logo for uh, the LRPG. And then, of course, they transitioned to the Air Force Missile Test Center, Air Force Eastern Test Range, where they went to the more uh, generic kind of uh, Air Force uh, logo, and the Eastern Space and Missile Center, or ESMIC, as people referred to it as. And then they stood up the 45th Space Wing, which is the current uh, 
organizational wing that, that runs the Cape and the Eastern Range. And the 45th Space Wing, of course, being transferred from, from the Air Force to the Space Force. No new logo, no new patch expected. That heraldry, that history will continue. Here's the Blue Scout, always a, a, a fun model. And it would be interesting because you have these great spin motors on there that uh, would fly off after it would leave the launch rail and ignite the motors and spin it up. And those things would fly away. Uh, that would make for a very interesting scale model if you can put your Micro Max or your mini engines in. I want to see it. I want to see it. Oh, and here's a, a shout out to uh, Chaz Russell, Air Force veteran who worked many an hour sweating underneath one of these hound dog missiles. This one is the one that used to sit outside at the museum at uh, Complex 5-6, and it's been completely refurbished, and it looks absolutely fabulous now. So uh, here's to you, Chaz. Hats off, and thanks for your service. <laughs> So uh, moving on to some other, I, I love I love the texture of of this nose cone, the cork uh, blade of cork. Cork blade of on a, a Gem 46, which is a strap on for uh, Delta twos and Delta threes. Uh, you know you you paint your rockets in nice uh, glossy coats, but then you know on these strap ons, if you were to have a cottage cheese finish on your nose cone, it would be accurate. So it's not a bad deal. And this segment is the uh, Piece apparently from the first Delta III launch back in 1998. And several months ago, here's what, 32 some years later, a piece of this washed ashore in Melbourne Beach, which is about 25 miles south of the Cape. Uh, and it was a failure on the first Delta III mission. Eventually that vehicle got canceled. It was a commercial effort by Boeing to uh, commercialize the Delta vehicle. Uh, and it was a first flight, but they made some miscalculations on the, the guidance system and the hydraulically powered thrust vectoring systems on the uh, couple of the strap-ons ran out of hydraulic fluid too early in flight before they finished burning out. So the vehicle went off course and the uh, range safety officer had to destroy it. And so these pieces uh, washed up on shore several months later, or several years several later. Several, many years later, Many yeah. years later. You can so, see the uh, composite nature of that, yeah. Yeah, and you know, D, an earlier Boeing first flight failure. <laughs> hmm, can we say uh, uh, Starliner ooh, ooh, or uh, <laughs> SLS Green Run? Sorry, Boeing, but uh, you know, you've been uh, screwing things up for a little while now. Time to get your act together. And here is the, the star of the show right now. None of you have seen this, this is brand new. Uh, in the hangar and return from the uh, from the refurbishing world. This is the Pershing missile. Um, this is one that'll touch Matt Steele, who uh, worked on these things in Germany in the 80s. Uh, and uh, God bless you, Matt. You know this thing has been uh, completely redone. It looks absolutely fabulous, including the trailer launcher erector uh, facility. Now, you know we'll show some other close-ups of this missile, but. Uh, if I know Matt Steele talked about this being possibly a future North Coast rocketry product, uh, I would love to see a Pershing II because I've got this scale detail model right uh, right on base here that I can go and get uh, close up pictures of. And 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 the fact that the trailer is part of this is is impressive to me because you think it's just hard to redo the redo the missile, but to redo the trailer to find you know replacement wheels from the right company to find all the right tools that were part of it and of course just the whole finished job and 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 all the effort that goes into this this, this is such an impress even in its olive drab green color it is such an impressive thing i mean even you got the launch control panel here well, and you can tell the launch code because the numbers are a little bit more worn in some places than others so that's one right. four three seven uh, execute okay well now i remember that now you can remember that real easy so uh and and they the attention to dlt the attention to detail was such that they even uh, and, and how you had to be resourceful in going out to uh, the world to find replacement parts is they even wound up having to go to Sears to get some craftsman tools. And you're going to see that in just a second. They um, these trailers obviously had tools that you needed to uh, to work on the missile in the field. And uh, and do what you had to do. And there they are, I mean, tied right onto the, the grail. Uh, where they were originally. Uh, where they were originally. And I'm guess, sure that uh, Sears did not charge the Army $800 per no, wrench for these. I'm no. sure they were low cost. 
but the attention to detail that it takes to find that in a drawing or a uh, or a picture, an old picture, and then go hunt down something that they thought was historically accurate. Yeah, and look at all the little uh, bumps and greeblies and and uh, panels, lines, and everything on here. I mean, this would really be a great scale model because it's not just a couple of tubes and some nose tones. It's got all kinds of little things. That, raised areas and rivet detail and, and uh, vet right. ports and everything. The rivet counters would have a field day with this if you if you got even one rivet wrong. Beautiful missile, just just spectacular. And again, brand new to the hangar. Let's pause a second. We got a couple of questions we'll hit. Uh, who owns these missiles now and is there a foundation? Question from Steve Crystal via Ed LaCroix. And, uh, Yes, they belong to the Air Force Museum or the Air Force uh, Museum Foundation pays for some of the work to get them refurbished. Yeah, the, the missiles themselves, I mean, one answer to say is they do not belong to the Smithsonian. They do belong to the Air Force and, and they are on loan from the Air Force, the official Air Force Museum to Cape Canaveral. Um, the Air Force Space and Missile Museum Foundation is the nonprofit organization that's been stood up to assist uh, the Air Force in telling the Cape story. Uh, I have served on that board for a couple of decades, and um, and we could spend the next four hours talking about the challenges we've had in um, in getting things done. But the grand vision is to move all of these missiles uh, to a facility outside the security gate uh, where the History Center is now, where some of you remember. The, may remember the history center um and where that navajo was used to be in that in that lot area uh is where we intend to eventually build a facility but that's still years and years away unfortunately so here's a final pan around the hangar c so you can get a uh, again get a good idea of just what missiles and, and rockets are there and again, uh, now with the new lighting and all, uh, you can get great photos in there. You can obviously get up close and measure things. Uh, it, it really is a, a fabulous place to, to spend a couple of hours. You know, and uh, unfortunately on our bus tour, we didn't go quite that long, but we did have some time in there. And yes, people did literally climb on rockets to, to take measurements. Um, Jonathan Raines asked a question about the plaque on the Pershing II at the Air and Space Museum saying it's still covered under the INF Treaty. I do not know the answer to that question. Yeah, it's a that's great true. question. Uh, it is, and in fact, this Pershing II in Hangar C is full of concrete. And if uh, Russian treaty inspectors wanted to come by and look at it, they could because there's panels they can take off and see that, yay, verily, there is no solid propellant inside, but it's filled with, uh, with concrete. I knew it was inert, but I did not know it was filled with concrete. Yep, they had to do that. Uh, another question here from Ed Pearson. How many space launches have occurred in total from uh, Cape Canaveral Spaceport from 1950 to the present? I don't have my uh, my Cape launch history handy, but it's on the order of 3,600, 3,700. And that's just the major vehicles. Uh, if you start adding in the Arcus launches, the uh, Nike Smokes, the Super Lokis, the Loki Darts and all that, uh, it's on the order of, 10 to 15,000 because uh, back in the day, they would launch uh, three Super Lokis every day. So they have uh, morning, noon, and afternoon uh, to get the upper altitude winds. And of course, they launched a bunch of Arcus weather rockets and Nike smokes as well, and several other small sounding rocket vehicles out there. So it's, it's uh, several, probably a good 10 to 15,000 vehicles have flown from the Cape. 3,700 for missiles and space vehicles, I would say. Yeah, yeah. And and we'll talk about the manifest come up and how that number is going to start climbing even faster. We're going to take you off to some of the pads, some of these you've seen. We're trying to give you some new views and old views. So here's Complex 14 with reserve parking right by the blockhouse uh, entrance of the four guys that flew into orbit and, uh, and the launch director of Complex 14. Yeah, and here's some great rules that you could apply on the launch range. You know, if you cross off uh, blockhouse and write in launch range, that would work well because then you have the launch conductor should be in charge. Operational silence, restrict movement. You know, don't be wandering out around the launch pads. 
Here's the scorecard on complex 14. And yes, it looks like, uh, you know, some of those look like mercury redstones, but I think they couldn't find the right uh, stencil. stencil to put the silhouettes on there. It would have been strange. On the other side of this uh, little walkway, by the way, is a single bathroom in Blockhouse 14 that uh, Joanne Morgan, uh, who was uh, the only female NASA engineer to be working out there at the time, would, would, would have to use with the guard out front. Um, and she's, she's fond of, of, of telling that story. Um, here's, here's Complex 14 in its heyday. I'm sure you've all seen this picture and, and kind of know, but to, re to remind you of what it used to like back then. And now here we're going to get a little pan view of what it looks like today. Yeah, I mean, it's looking the Blockhouse periscope still work. Blockhouse has been turned into a conference center, which is great because there's no uh, cell phone signals in there. You never get interrupted. But here's what that ramp looks like now. It is labeled, they're listed as a National Historic Site, so they can't do anything. They're never going to uh, rework that. Here's the Mercury 7 monument, the original one with the 500-year time capsule out front at the uh, entrance to Complex 14 and uh, as a standard tour stop on any tour of the Cape. So we wanted to make sure that we stopped here for you as well. And we, uh, you drive up the road a little bit to Complex 19, uh, home of all the Gemini Titan missions. And here they are listed, um, 10 missions, not even two years. Um, this is, you know, it, it's not a rocket, it's not a pad, it's, it's, it's not anything but a sign. And yet to me, it certainly as a kid growing up, this was the, one of the coolest signs I thought. And even as I got older and you understand the perspective to just think back for a second and consider that, you know, you had 10 missions. I mean, and it wasn't even a full two years I mean, from March of 65 to, to what was it, November of 66. Ten missions, each one of them manned, um, each one of them basically completely different from the previous one. I mean, they, there was a building block thing where you, you know, you tried to gain experience and, and repeat things. Um, you know, the Gemini capsule, a lot of us at a, in our age, we just look back at that and say that's, that's the ultimate capsule and that's the fondness and that's the glory days of the Cape. And, and I still believe that. And this, this sign just means all that to me. By the way, Pat has a, has a little bit of history he can share. Well, let's see, when they, they refurbished this sign about five years ago and, and completely redid it. And I was driving by there like the day after they put it up and I looked on the GT10 like, and I don't remember who it was, but they had the wrong astronauts listed. So if you look close at this, they've got the, uh, and there's an overlay because they had to go back and correct it. And when I told the, uh, the civil servant that's the senior civil servant on the base that he put up an incorrect sign, I, I didn't endear myself to him, let's just say that. <laughs> but it was changed within a couple of days, so I give him a lot of credit. Where were GT2 uh, and Three launched or the earlier test missions were launched from Complex 19. People on liner asked that. Yep, yep, unmanned and flights. And here's what it looked like back in the day. And that Gemini 2 mission, that capsule reflew on the Manned Orbiting Laboratory mission, and that capsule's on display now inside the Space and Missile Museum out at 5-6. Uh, so five, here six. we're driving in the entrance road to Complex 19 towards the, uh, the blockhouse. You cannot go inside the blockhouse anymore. It's been... Uh, well, it's not condemned, but you wouldn't want to go in there because it's full of mold. And obviously it was built back in the day with lead paint, asbestos, and all those other fun things uh, that we used to be able to use. You know, as you look at the at these pads, and by the time you got to 19, uh, in terms of history, they, they had really figured out how to do a major launch pad. The, the design of it and the best practices had really come together. This is the trench to, to hold the, the retention pond of the water that was part of the uh, blast and was contaminated with all sorts of nastiness. Yeah, all the hypergolic uh, exhaust. And then back in the day when they used to static test the missiles on the launch pad, they would flush them out with uh, 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 these and TCE and all kinds of uh, nasty stuff. So that all got washed into that uh, retention pond or the uh, deluge pond. And they didn't bother treating it back in the day either, which is why you see a lot of uh, Fluoride frogs around the, the old launch complexes. Yeah, we're, 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 we're going to go through a very interesting walk that, that none of you can do, and, and, and none of us want to get actually kind of caught doing it. But I'll tell you about getting caught. It's a great story 
I'll tell you quick about this launch pad. A long time ago, and we're talking late 90s, um, the general of the, of, of the space wing, the second one, uh, Bob Dickman and I got to be good friends. And it was late Friday afternoon and he called me and I was in my office. I was a reporter at Florida Today back then. And he called me in the office and he says, what are you doing? And I says, nothing. You know, he says, you want to go for a drive around the Cape? And I said, sure. So I'll meet you in an hour at the gate. Uh, Bob was is a great friend of the history world in the Air Force. He's a real history aficionado. And so we we're going to go explore around, you know, the old pads. So it's late Friday. Nobody's out there. Everybody's gone home. And we come up on pad 19 and there's some smoke coming up from basically this area right here and we oh shoot you know what's going on and so here's the one star general and here's the face reporter from Florida today pulling up in the car and it turns out it's a bunch of guys that were having a barbecue <laughs> right there at the pad um not exactly allowed open flame in the launch pad but old or new um they might have even been roasting a roadkill pig. I can't remember for sure, but that rings a bell because that happened a lot out there in those days. And uh, and and we just, I love the, the idea of these guys getting caught with their barbecue, not only by just somebody, but by the one-star general and a reporter from the local <laughs> newspaper. Uh, and this, so this always reminds me of that story when we, so we're gonna go off through here uh, and take a look at what, uh, what nastiness is here too. So this is under uh, complex 19 and uh, on the left would have been the uh, hydraulic rooms and part of the, the base of the pad where the uh, erector launcher was that could uh, tighten up uh, onto the launch mount. And now, of course, you know, there's a lot of spalling concrete. There's lots of rust. You know, if anybody wants a, a baggie full of rust, you know, let me know and I'll go scrape up some of this nasty stuff for you. Uh, but, you know, you look around nowadays and it's like, okay, well, do we protect historic monuments uh, in the space program? And not really. Uh, but then there's, they don't have the money for it. And no, you don't want to go swimming in that water because that is where the four-eyed frogs are. And I have no idea what happens to the alligators that uh, are in the neighborhood. Uh, it's not even nasty. Here's, we're continuing to circle around pad 19. So again, more of the you, know, you can just see how the little berm at the sides here built up to, to help hold water in and, and at least control a little bit what's being uh, drained out into the, uh, into the actual soil. But, but, but pad 19 with the Titan and the Hypergalls uh, powering those two engines is just playing a nasty place all the way around. Um, Mad Max kind of territory out there, you know. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. looking down the cable tray back to the pad. And then driving out the perimeter road and looking at the blockhouse and uh, from the other side. Um, yep, lots of uh, overgrowth in this particular pad, as you'll see at some of the other uh, abandoned in place uh, launch complexes. Such a classic, iconic look that launch, that blockhouse. And, you know, you see them dot ICBM road and, you know, in amongst the, the modern stuff that, uh, that we're launching. I and mean, that's one reason why you can't refurbish a lot of stuff is because it's still an active space base. So, you know, here, for example, is Launch Complex 41, what it looks like with the fully fueled Atlas on the pad ready to go. And uh, now we're gonna take a little walk around 41 and, and give you some interesting views. All right, so uh, ULA, United Launch Alliance has been rebuilding the pad to accommodate the new Vulcan rocket, which is gonna fly maybe later this year. And they're still supporting Atlas V launches at the same time. They put in a giant new uh, liquid oxygen tank. You can see the uh, white uh, vacuum jacketed line that uh, transports the liquid oxygen up to the Centaur upper stage. And there's the crew access tower or CAT, which they built to accommodate uh, Starliner and Dream Chaser. Uh, here's part of the sound suppression, the acoustic suppression system. And then the flame duct. Uh, with all the water nozzles around it. Now I'm gonna zoom in here a little bit on there and we'll pause it for a second. As you can see at the, uh, you know, obviously at the base of the pad was underneath where the rocket sits and that's got a lot of flame damage. But look at the ceiling of the flame duct and you'll see all these little chevrons and a couple of protuberances and things. 
And these were put in there to change the exhaust flow coming out of that flame duct to improve the acoustic dampening effects. So, I mean, there was a lot of fluid dynamics involved. It's not just a, a flat ceiling uh, that the uh, this huge pressure wave at ignition and then the uh, first couple of seconds when the rocket takes off generates an awful lot of turbulence and acoustic energy. And these things are placed there to help uh, change the flow, the exhaust flow coming out of the flame duct. And then there's those big nozzles to dump more water in there. Now, all that stuff is to cut down on the acoustic energy. Also a great place to go skateboarding. The, so more plumbing. Uh, lots of uh, vacuum jacketed lines running uh, all the cryogenics out to the launch pad. The complexity. Oh, okay. So now we're going to take you to the top of 41 and we tell you there's only room for 12 people at a time. So we ask that you form a line and it will take you 12 at a time to the top of 41. You'll never get to see this unless you're working out there. So on the left, a couple of new tanks for Vulcan, uh, some of their uh, oxidizer tanks. Then these three giant 100,000 gallon a piece uh, methane tanks, which are going to be the fuel for Vulcan. Uh, in the distance, pad 39A, where SpaceX flies their Crew Dragon and their cargo resupply missions, as well as other Falcon 9 and the Falcon Heavy fly from there. And then you look across all the, uh, the swampy land that uh, comprises this area, and there you see the vehicle assembly building in the distance as well. Now looking to the south from atop Complex 41, on the right is the uh, vertical integration facility for the Atlas V. And in the distance, the uh, a couple of the older buildings left over from the Titan III and Titan IV programs now in use by uh, SpaceX and ULA for other activities. So the, the former solid motor assembly building is now in use by SpaceX. It has a couple of white rooms, or clean rooms in it, and they use it for payload processing. And then the SMAB solid motor assembly building, which was built for Titan IV, is used by ULA. And that's in fact where they're building the, the new launch platform for Vulcan, which uh, rolled to the pad the first time, I think on Friday it was scheduled for. I didn't see any news about it yet, but it was supposed to roll out to the pad for fit checks. The, uh, the road that goes all the way back to the SMAB, that big long road there, is, used to be the railway. Uh, from moving the Titan vehicles uh, back and forth, Titan 3, Titan 4. That locomotive is the one you see out at the Space and Missile Center, uh, or at the uh, Space and Missile Museum out at uh, 5626. Um, this is a fun road to drive down because basically there's no real shoulder here. It's a raised uh, level of cement that's what, a foot or two? It's a good foot or so, and then where it used to be, uh railroad tracks when they used to move the, the Titan platforms out to the pad. Well, now you just fall off. So if, uh, you know, I don't care what your smart car has, if it uh, does not stay on the road, you're going to fall off and drag your suspension uh, on oh, a, it, a one foot drop off. Nasty, so nasty. It's so scary to drive on that road to me anyway. And so there's the VIF, uh, which the extra doors pause it here. So You'll notice that there's a there is a launch platform inside. No vehicle stack there yet. They were getting ready to start stacking the uh, Atlas V for the next Starliner flight test. It hadn't started yet. But uh, interesting on here, it used to have uh, a single giant roll-up door, which was basically heavy fabric that came all the way down from where the ULA logo is at the top, and it would roll down that uh, you know 200 plus feet down to the to the ground. But uh, couple of hurricanes ago, and this is probably about 15 years ago, uh, when a hurricane was offshore of the Cape, and we were getting some pretty serious winds on the order of 80 to 100 miles an hour. And there were several workers there during the ride out crew, and they heard this extremely loud ruffling sound, big thump. And they went out and looked, and part of that door, the fabric door, had collapsed and fallen down. So after that, you can see they've added these gray doors on here now, which are hard doors, and they swing out on these cantilevered uh, beams. And you can see down at the base there, a couple of them are closed, uh, just above where the thing is. Yeah, right around there, those two doors are closed, and the other four sets on top of that are open. So now they've got uh, a much stronger uh, hurricane protection. 
As we pan around uh, farther to the south, there's Complex 40, the other SpaceX pad in the distance, uh, the uh, Delta IV launch pad, 37. 37, and south of that, you can see a little bit of 36. Here's the uh, walkway out to the White Room, which is going to be used for Starliner and for uh, uh, Dream Chaser, the Sierra Nevada Dream Chaser, when that starts flying here in the next couple of years. Now, if there's an on pad emergency, uh, you're going to follow that uh, yellow walkway here. Yeah, and I want to point out while we're, while we're, when I restart this is notice that the grading, you know, normally on a pad, you see the steel grading and you look down, you can, you know, see two or three hundred feet below you, uh, depending on how high you are. But when you're on a crew access level, this is all filled in. This is solid. And, and the reason may be intuitive is that if you do have anything nasty happening underneath you, uh, this prevents flames or gases or whatever from uh, basically going right up through the, the grate and uh, taking you out. But it could be nasty. You might not be able to see very well. So you have the big yellow uh, uh, stripe and, and the black arrows make it very clear where you need to go. And then you come out here to the uh, slide wires and there's, uh, they use harnesses, not baskets like they used to use on the shuttle pads. And uh, it's probably, uh, you know, a great zip line ride that they can charge money for. Well, let's go for a ride, That's shall we? That's a great idea. We, we, Pat wanted to take credit for running this himself, but this is a ULA video that they actually re released probably about a year or so ago. And this gets up to about 30 or 40 miles an hour on the way down. And then just before you land, the, uh, the way it's, uh, the wire is strung, you slow down to basically a walking pace uh, just before you touch ground, and then you stop, disconnect your harness, and run for cover. Yeah, run, run, run. I don't know if they're going to have tanks there or not. I mean, in shovel days, they had a tank there, but uh, I don't know. Let's find out. Okay, now we're on top of Complex 20, which was a uh, Titan 1 and a Titan 3A pad. And this one is being reworked for uh, Firefly. Uh, Space Florida and the state have taken, uh, going to get a license from the Air Force, and we're going to sublease it to Firefly Aerospace out of, uh, out of Texas. And they're going to fly both their Alpha and beta vehicles from here. So you can get an idea of the uh, former Titan pad complex, the, the lightning mast in the background where they launched Prospector, Starbird, and Red Tigress uh, suborbital vehicles back in the 90s. Uh, you can see the revetments where fuel tanks used to sit, and then back down the ramp where they used to roll the vehicles up. Now, here's a little stain on the ground, and uh, um, we know that we're 20 seconds ahead of you guys in terms of what you can see, but uh, anybody want to hazard a guess as to what that is? Um, that is a major piece of history right here on the Space Coast. And I don't know, some of you may have been able to come out and see this, depending on what bus you were on uh, back in um, 2019 or 2014. But this is the spot. This is the spot where Bumper took off, where the very first launch from Cape Canaveral took place um, in uh, July of 1950. Um, the, the darkened square with the little squares on the corner here, I mean, it's, it's, this is basically the blast deflector where it sat for years. And uh, there's talk of, um, of trying to cut this whole area out right here, just preserve this, this kind of coloration, this, this mark. Put a plaque there so that you mark the spot as in terms of a historic point and then put this on display somewhere. But uh, going from the very, very old, I mean, literally the beginning of the Cape, then we'll pan up and Pat will tell you about what we're about to see. All right, so we start looking, uh, as we look up from Complex 3, and we see the newest pad, which is gonna be the Blue Origin New Glen launch pad at Complex 36, which is adjacent to complexes one, two, three, and four. Now, to give you an idea of scale, those uh, lightning masts are about 525 feet tall. And no, I was not allowed on top of those either because uh, Jeff Bezos does not want to give me uh, insurance. Let's pause it here a second. So we're looking in the distance from, this is from complex 46, this view, looking towards 36. Again, the lightning masts are 500, over 530 feet tall. The integration building on the left there, where they're going to roll the uh, boosters in before they uh, integrate them and stack them to the on the pad. That building is over 560 feet long and about 14 stories tall. 
and it's got room for three new Glenn boosters inside. So uh, everything that uh, Blue Origin is doing out here is done on a very large scale. 525 feet tall. I mean, it, it, you, as usual, there's nothing to compare that, no perspective, no smaller building, no familiar object, no little person. But, but those towers, those lighting towers are taller than the vehicle assembly building. I mean, just to put that in perspective, that, that water tower is huge. And supposedly uh, it's the tallest water tower uh, in the United States and maybe the world. And, you know, it's only 300 and some feet tall. Uh, but then the, uh, the new Glen's going to roll out from the integration building, get hydraulically stood up on that launch mount. The flame duct is just gigantic. I mean, everything about this is big. And, and maybe maybe this is the only perspective I can offer you, but but the same block house we just drove by, pad 19, here's the pad 36 block house, which the was original a bit Atlas block house, which was a little, a little bit, bit larger. But it's getting dwarfed by all this new construction that uh, that Blue Origin is doing. And that building, man, just that's like one big giant movie screen, I don't know. And other big stuff. Blue Origin does nothing on a small scale, obviously. This is the uh, manufacturing facility where you're going to build the new Glenn boosters. And this is the orbital booster, not the new Shepard uh, crew carrying uh, suborbital one that they fly in Texas. Now, Blue Origin has over a million square feet in this building. They have about half a dozen buildings in this complex on Merritt Island, just near the visitor complex. And they have close to 2 million square feet when you consider the manufacturing building, the warehouses, they've got the very tall uh, tank coating structure. And you see the great uh, S-band antennas on the roof as well, which they're going to use to communicate with the vehicle, which is about uh, a little ways away. Now we head out to the, uh, let's go ahead and pause it here so yeah. I can get my ad in, even though I have, these are not official space Florida comments. But the former shuttle landing facility has been taken over by Space Florida. We now operate it. Uh, NASA has uh, dispensed with any of uh, any of the maintenance on it, and Space Florida handles all that now. So the three-mile-long runway at the shuttle landing facility, now referred to as the launch and landing facility, because we're going to support both horizontal uh, takeoff uh, space boosters, such as uh, we expect to have uh, Virgin Galactic show up and or virgin orbit rather and several of uh, the other ones like generation orbit they're going to fly out of here and also it's going to be used for the uh, sierra nevada dream chaser for their landing which is uh, coming up here shortly the and and just to put to make sure you know where you're at we're now at the kennedy space center so when we saw that blue origin building we had crossed the uh, banana river into kennedy space center property that road that we were on i, I guess that doesn't hurt to go back just a couple of seconds um, this road here is the road that connects State Road 3 with the entrance to the visitor complex. This is a public road, so you can drive on it. Here you can see the shuttle from the Atlantis building in the background where the visitor complex is. So you can drive by this and, and take a look at it. Just don't go in the parking lot because then they'll look at you nasty. But here at Kennedy Space Center, uh, some neat things to see around the shuttle, the launch and landing facility, excuse me. Launch and landing facility. Um, all run by Fish Space Florida. Uh, T-38s, astronauts pop in occasionally. Uh, we do some other uh, aeronautical events, like uh, these guys were releasing a, a balloon payload with a camera on it, strangely enough, doing a commercial for the Florida Lottery, of all things. And then we other have fun straight line testing of stuff. So who comes out here? And we'll run this a couple of times. Uh, Indy cars come out and test. We've had NASCAR guys in the past, Tesla, Volvo, several truck manufacturers, Love running on this runway because this is uh, it's super flat. Uh, there's barely a, a, an inch or so uh, slope to it from one end to the other. It slopes in the center off to the sides, but it's super flat down its uh, entire three mile length. So you see a lot of uh, we rent it out now to uh, race car teams that want to come out and do straight line testing. Several uh, supercar production cars that uh, hit high speeds want to be tested out here. In fact, a couple of weeks ago, somebody hit 289 miles an hour with the production sports car. So uh, Space Florida is keeping the place gainfully employed. And we're uh, getting ready to do some big um, uh, refurbishment, like we're replacing all of the runway lights. We're going to repaint the runway markers. And then uh, while we didn't show it this time, because 
uh, we uh, I didn't get a chance to get out there in the last couple of weeks. We had so much going on, uh, but there are markers on the side of the runway for the wheel stop locations for all the, sh the, the last three shuttle flights. This is one of those videos where we, where we I wish I had put the audio back in because again, to be that close to these things screaming like, oh, by the way, you want you want to know how they build Dream Tracer? This is how they do it. So simple. Ta -da. All right, so that's the, let's back up to that, and we'll do a quick pause on that one. So uh, Sierra, Sierra Nevada, we'll wait till it gets fully inflated. Um, so Sierra Nevada Corporation is building the Dream Chaser, and this is a, a full-size uh, inflatable mock-up, which you don't see every day. Uh, <laughs> but uh, they're going to fly this on top of Atlas Vs. Their first contract is with NASA for cargo resupply flights to the space station, and the Interesting thing about Dream Chaser is obviously it's a lifting body. It has a gliding re-entry. So when it lands, you get maybe on the order of three Gs rather than six or seven that you would get coming back on a, a Dragon capsule, a Crew Dragon. So uh, it's going to be a lot easier on the experiments and uh, the specimens and things that they bring back from the ISS. And then in the future, they anticipate uh, that'll all be unmanned when it's doing cargo flights. Sorry uncrewed cargo flights. And then uh, in a couple of years, they intend to get a contract with NASA to fly crews up to the space station as well. Uh, there's a 50,000 square foot hangar uh, adjacent to the LLF. Uh, now it has a couple of NASA helicopters and these have been replaced by uh, newer ones. Those are all uh, uh, Vietnam era UH-1 Hueys. Uh, and now we also rent out uh, the space in the uh, hangar to Starfighters, who has a fleet of F-104s that they've picked up surplus from uh, the Italian Air Force and the Canadian Air Force. And they use those. They have some contracts with NASA for high-speed testing. They can fly uh, Mach 2, and they can also do zoom flights up to 70,000, 80,000 feet. Uh, if you want to do a space tourism kind of uh, thing, you can, you can rent a ride on a uh, Starfighter and, and, and go uh, Mach 2 and up high. This is a great little hanger off, but off the LLF. This is just to mark a point of history here as we come up on an anniversary this week. This is where this is the same building and the floor where after the Columbia disaster and pieces were brought back from Texas and in that area of the country were laid out on the floor to uh, help with the reconstruction and the uh, and the post action the inspections. Um, so a lot, just you know one of those little parts that is. You don't know what's there unless someone tells you. So now we're going for a fun ride up the elevator in the vehicle assembly building. Who gets to do this on any given day? And I wouldn't call this a junket. I was escorting a group of legislative staffers from from the state of Florida. So, you know, yeah, you got to deal with politicians, but you get to do some interesting things occasionally. You know, normal folks that work out there don't get to ride the AD elevators, but boy, you bring the folks that have something to do with uh, financing and funding. And by golly, they throw out the red carpet for you. That's right, you get to go up and take a look at everything and um, we'll get a good view. Ed's got a question we're gonna answer here in a second when I get a good view of it. So here's here's at the big, almost to the very top of the vehicle assembly building. One of the walkways in between the high bays, uh, walking out towards uh, some of the giant pocket doors where the uh, uh, Saturns and shuttles were stacked. Look over here on the right and there's some of the 200 and plus some cranes I used to lift the uh, uh, the shuttle and uh, Atlas or, and Saturn hardware. Now they're going to use it for SLS. There's a complex 39B in the distance where the uh, SLS is going to launch from. Now been converted over from shuttle days to a clean pad concept for the space launch system. So basically, uh, the majority of the uh, propellant handling equipment for the liquid propellant on the core vehicle is going to be coming through the mobile launch platform. Yeah, Ed LaCroix asked in the questions, where is the Artemis pad construction? That is the Artemis pad right there. The Artemis pad is pad 39B, uh, 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 where yeah, Skylab shuttle uh, uh, Palo Soyuz took off from. Yeah, and I didn't get the, uh, the new uh, mobile launch platform and umbilical tower is inside one of the other high bays. This was shot a few months ago before that was available. But you can see the work platforms that fold down around the SLS vehicle to allow access to the various areas. 
And then when you look out, uh, you know, one of the open doors here, and this shows that's 39A fuzzily in the background. You can see the crawler way, you know, three space. and a half miles uh, out there. Here's the ceiling of the VAB. And in some places, there's uh, netting hanging underneath there because the concrete is falling and would fall on your to catch things. And then we look down uh, into the other high bay, and here's one of the old shuttle mobile launch platforms that is uh, that's still there and been moved out and has since been uh, uh, scrapped out. And we're back at Wolfie's. So if you want your uh, <laughs> corned beef sandwich, now's the time to. To get that, so we're going to show you one more, uh, one more thing which we had so promised, I'm and I'm going to let me get it set up here. And um, this is uh, this is Bob Cabana's view out his window, uh, recorded by him. Uh, at one point, when he shows you part of his office, you'll actually see his his reflection. It's just one of those, um, what's the right word? Charming moment. Center holding his personal iPhone up, take video for you. So, and this is only a minute long. So, let me get it ready to go. Share that, and then enjoy this with his with his with his commentary. So I thought I'd share with all of you a, a little view out my uh, office uh, window. Uh, here we are in my office. Uh, you can see there's a, a picture of what the uh, space station looked like when I left it. The Unity node was Zarya. I love this oil painting of the, uh, the space shuttle out on the pad. But then if you come and look out my window, <clears throat> of course, you can see the VAB. Let me zoom in here. There's the VAB. You got pad 39A, 39B. Down there is pad 41. And then if we come over here, and we come out this window, we got pad 40, 37. Pretty cool view. Not, not a bad place to work, is it? And and, and <laughs> that's it. So um, yeah, so there you go. So that's our that's our little look around the Cape. Um, let me ask, let's answer. Are you ready to answer that question from Jeff Taylor? Um, no, I'll have to think about memory. it. Jeff Taylor asks uh, for each of you, what is your single proudest memory of all the things you've seen and done? Well, I presume you're asking about uh, space related stuff. Uh, yeah. Certainly not uh, family things. But uh, uh, for me, I think it was uh, being able to work on the uh, in my previous incarnation, I worked for Computer Sciences Raytheon on the Air Force Station side, and we ran all the instrumentation that tracked uh, all the launches. So everything that launched from the CAPE or KSC, we provided support to. And uh, I worked there for 16 years before I came over to Space Florida. And uh, during the time that I was in charge of the program management section there, we supported 136 launches, and we had zero scrubs that were attributable to the range instrumentation. So we provided all the support that uh, customers, NASA, Department of Defense, and the commercial operators uh, required with, uh, with no scrubs. So we always had the instrumentation ready. We always provided the services that they asked for and needed uh, to support their launches. Yeah, there were scrubs, but it was vehicles or it was the uh, weather or something. But the instrumentation when I was working there, we never caused a scrub. And uh, we were all very proud of that. And I had a small part to play in that, uh, but I was very proud of that, uh, that 136 uh, launch string. Proudest memory, it's, it's, it's tough. I mean, there's your starkest memories, of course, for me as a journalist and kind of having a front seat to a lot of history and, and getting to know a lot of people um, as friends that I grew up as, as heroes. Um, and I suppose I could name drop a bunch of them, but I won't. Um, my, the highlights of my career as a space reporter, the things that I had that just really stick with me the most, um, I think top of the list is being at JPL in 1980, 1990, 1980, 1990, um, for the Neptune encounter. 
when uh, Voyager 2 flew by Neptune and we discovered, well, not discovered, explored that planet close up for the first time, uh, where you're sitting at your desk. I was sharing a desk with a, a, a gentleman from Japan who who ate some sushi for breakfast that I don't ever want to see again. Um, but uh, it was a remarkable memory and waiting for each picture to come in line by line. Back then, of course, it was very slow bit rate. It was literally you're watching line by line paint in and everyone doing instant science. That was great. And then and then I've been to Moscow twice to cover uh, the space program there. And um, the work that I did as a journalist and the ability to get it back, technically to get it back, this was in 1994, 1995, uh, was certainly proud, uh, proud moments. A uh, question from Bruce Norton. What is the status of Hangar S? Uh, it's being refurbished. It's being turned over to Blue Origin. They're going to use it, I think, for ground support equipment storage and things like that. Uh, Hangar S obviously was, uh, if you recall, was used for the, uh, the Mercury astronauts used that for, uh, uh, for a suit up and their crew quarters uh, on the Cape side back in the Mercury days before they had the uh, operations and checkout building on Kennedy Space Center. So uh, that is being refurbished and it's good to see it uh, put back in use because it's been basically abandoned for about the last 10 or 15 years. Nobody's been using it. Yeah, it's, it's basically been a shell and, and was marked for destruction uh, as soon as they could, could get the money. And there was, there's been various efforts to, to sang, save Hangar S and I've been involved. Uh, on, on the other side, I've never believed we should save it. Um, that's maybe not a popular view, but but it's a it's a pragmatic one. Um, it had it's been used from time to time in some some TV and movie settings. There's some stuff painted on the walls in the front of Hangar S right now that are left over from from uh, I think even things like um, from the Earth to the Moon, from the Earth to the Moon, and and um, um, oh, I'm blanking out on what the name is. I'm trying to find the book, but I can't. Um, but anyway, yeah, so good to see that it's at least, quote unquote, saved for now. And um, and there you go. we got about 10 minutes left, I think. Are we supposed to go up to 30? Yeah, well, let's give our credits. Obviously, a big shout out to uh, the Bob Cabana Kennedy Space Center Center Director for him taking time out of his busy schedule to shoot those videos for us. Very supportive. Uh, Bob's a great guy, and we really appreciate uh, what he did for us. Also, the uh, director of the Air Force Space and Missile Museum on uh, Cape Canaveral Space Force Station, James, Jamie Draper. Uh, if you uh, look up the Space and Missile Museum, I presume on Facebook, I know I see him on LinkedIn, uh, James Draper, D-R-A-P-E-R. -E he posts a lot of great stuff of all the current activities they're doing out there. Every time they move a missile, paint something, uh, he's digging up things out of the archives and he runs a lot of neat stuff on I think both Facebook and LinkedIn. So James Draper, uh, we want to thank you for that. And of course, my sponsor, CosmicVest.com. And then let's say uh, we are supposed to give you some idea of what's coming up in the uh, in the reasonable uh, future here. So we're going to show you a a, a quick uh, screenshot of uh, of the launches and things that are on the manifest for this year. Okay, we've already flown three Falcon 9s. Uh, we've got 48 launches on the manifest slash schedule. Uh, some of them are not hard and fast on the schedule, but they're out there. Falcon 9 obviously is going to be the busiest Starlink mission. So all the SpaceX internal flights, uh, three cargo resupply missions to the uh, space station, two Crew Dragon flights scheduled, uh, six commercial flights on Falcon 9s, including another polar orbit mission. And boy, are those fun to watch from the Cape. Oh, well, see, and I live south of the Cape, and so does, so does Pat. I'm a little further south than his. And you're so used to being able to go out your front door and watch your rocket go a certain way. And when these last two ones that went polar, uh, which is basically dog leg to the south, there's a noticeable difference. You see that rocket is coming right at you. I mean, that's the way it looks. And it is, it is at once the most impressive and scary thing, <laughs> and it sure shakes the house because we don't normally get the sound as much. We get a little bit coming, you know, this far away, but when it's flying right over you, you know, you obviously get the sound coming right down on you, and um, uh, it's it's a remarkable. And uh, a couple of those are probably going to have landings, which I'm still not used to. I mean, it's 
freaks me out to watch a rocket with flames underneath. Uh, basically, looks like it's directly overhead. And those of you who are here for NARCON in 2019, and when, of course, we scheduled a launch and landing uh, for you when that happened, uh, got to see a landing. Obviously, it's very unusual to watch a rocket coming back in the other direction. So it's it's a spectacular thing. You get the great sonic booms off of it when it lands. Uh, really fun to watch. So all their Falcon 9 missions, they got a couple of uh, DOD missions and NRO missions and a NASA science mission, IXPE, and somebody will have to remind me of which particular one that is. Atlas V's got seven flights scheduled for this year. Uh, you've got the Starliner uh, Orbital Flight Test 2 coming up. Um, right now it's scheduled for March 25th. And then if that works properly later in the year, they're going to do the crew flight test up to the ISS as well. And then they're flying three uh, Department of Defense missions and a couple of miss missions for NASA. Falcon Heavy's got three launches on the schedule this year, two big ones for Department of Defense and a commercial one, I think, for a very large uh, communication satellite. Uh, inaugural flights we're going to see this year, maybe, maybe not. Uh, the NASA Space Launch System is on the calendar for November. Of course, the trouble they had with the Green Run uh, test a couple of uh, weeks ago might put that in jeopardy. I'm not a betting man, but if I was, I would not bet on seeing an SLS launch. Yeah, and they said they Friday, should. in case you hadn't seen the news, they said late Friday that they are going to go ahead and do a full second attempt at a Green Run here in February, and at least the official word officially is that uh, that if that goes well they still have room in the schedule to get off before the end of the year but again i'm not holding my breath yeah i see on the chat here that ron claperich is running the clip from the movie airplane and yes that's exactly how we felt when we watched <laughs> the first spacex booster coming back to land at the cape it's coming right at us i wanted to dive under jim's car <laughs> We picked the wrong day to, to stop, give up something. Stop, to stop sniffing glue or whatever. Okay, other inaugural flights this year. Uh, ULA getting ready with their Vulcan. That's going to be fun. Hopefully that'll uh, that'll be flying before the end of the year. Uh, Relativity, which is another small launch company, is rebuilding Complex 16, another former Titan pad. They're planning their first flight later this year towards the uh, fourth quarter. Uh, and Generation Orbit which is an air-launched vehicle, an air-dropped uh, vehicle is going to fly the X-60A, which is a uh, hypersonic test bed for, I think, its Air Force Research Lab. Now, they're going to take off from Cecil Spaceport up near Jacksonville and then fly down here into the range, the eastern range uh, coverage area with the uh, radars and telemetry, and they'll be able to track that uh, X-60A vehicle from there. And, you know, we might have a couple of uh, classified Navy Trident, uh, Trident two D5 missiles, but I can't tell you about those because I'd have to come and virtually kill you through this virtual connection. That's right. By the way, I'm, I'm particularly looking forward to the Vulcan. I know that a lot of the flight hardware is ready to go. They just need to get it here and stack. I, I think that this is one of those brilliantly beautiful, simple designs. I mean, there's, there's nothing really anything unusual about it, but there's just something about the perspective, the boosters, um, the, the, the livery, if they stick with it, um, I think is, is really cool. So if anybody wants to start uh, putting a kit together, um, you know. And I'll, here's my shout out to Rebecca Zurich. She noticed that I had my Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University uh, mug here. So uh, good luck, Rebecca. Uh, that's right. We're all counting on you. That's right. You are you are our future. Um, okay, so with the, the four minutes left, um, anybody have any? We're again, give us twenty seconds here. But well, we got the a thank you from Vern Estes, and not a question, just a big thank you for the tour. Well, you're welcome, welcome, Vern. Uh, Thanks, Vern. Best regards to you and Glita. Uh, we love you both. Hope you're doing well. Uh, and Jennifer Ash, thanks for letting us know that the SpaceX IXPE mission is the imaging x-ray photo, or sorry, imaging x-ray polar polarimetry. Polar, 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 polar polarimetry. polarimetry. See, it, the science doesn't count. It's the rocket that launches. Right. The cargo is just secondary. It's all about the launch. Payloads are, are secondary. That's right. That's right. Okay. Um, well, with that, then, thanks for watching. We're going to hit our stop broadcast button, and um, which means uh, you'll see us say goodbye in about 20 seconds. So thanks again. Uh, great. 
virtual Narcon conference. Thanks for Todd uh, Schwein for, for doing this. Things ran great. Well, and thank you all for attending today. Hope you enjoyed it, and uh, we'll see you out on the flying field. Go Buccaneers.